Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's The World This Week, The World This Week in partnership with The Daily Beast. We're in the company of anne Elisabeth Moutet, columnist for The Daily Telegraph and The Sunday Telegraph. And uh, also with us, Newport Tawari, founder of Smashboard, uh, which is uh, a social media app, but also... Feminist news and analysis. That's it. News and, and, and features. And, all right. <laughs> Regis Le Sommier, deputy editor-in-chief at uh, the French uh, news weekly Paris Match. And Marc Bassett, Paris correspondent for uh, El Pais. Just before the break, Mark, we were talking uh, about uh, the fact that uh, the, the UK is very much going to be staying on our radars uh, in 2020 uh, what with the trade uh, talks that will be going on with the European Union, but also the pressure coming from north of the border from Scotland with the First Minister buoyed by a strong show. She's saying that's, that's a, that, that should make the case for a second independence referendum uh, in Scotland. Uh, people in Spain must be watching that closely. They're watching uh, in Spain and in Catalonia. Uh, Scotland wants to remain and voted remain in the European Union. Uh, England voted independent from the European Union. You know, one of the messes that it all has created is this new, this new complication. Uh, Scotland already had a referendum. They want another re referendum. I wonder how will Boris Johnson deal uh, with uh, with this issue? How will he answer? Uh, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, Scott. He's, he said he'll ignore he it, can he? He has, first of all, the vote of 2014. There was a referendum for Scottish independence in 2014, before the idea of Brexit was even invented. And uh, uh, Brexit voted at any rate, and the, 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 the Scots voted to remain within the Union. Nicola Sturgeon now says that because of Brexit, uh, um, the, uh, the Scotland should be allowed to have another referendum. But in 2014, the Scottish government signed on to uh, the referendum, which has to be authorised by Westminster because it's, it's a member of the Union, uh, that it, they would wait for 10 years before holding another referendum if they did not like the, the result of the first one. So that would be until 2024 which, if you think about it, is not so far. The idea that Boris Johnson is going to say, no, you can have one straight away four years early, uh, just when you've had so many votes within, within Britain is inconceivable. The idea said, look, you've got only four years to wait, make your case, I will make my case in, uh, in, in, in sort of you know, making Brexit succeed, which is not yet uh, uh, something that is going to be you know, certain. And depending on whether uh, uh, the... Uh, um, Britain manages to have a negotiation with the European Union that makes for easy uh, trade and relations or not, uh, I would imagine that the question of the referendum to uh, the independence referendum will become entirely either moot or uh, necessary in, in the next few years. I don't see why the, uh, the schedule should be shortened. But what if the, this is a question, what, what if the Scottish do as the Catalan independentist and say, even if Westminster doesn't uh, uh, give us permission to organize a second referendum, we will go ahead and we'll do it. Is it a, a, a possible scenario? In, in Several things. One is that Scotland receives actually more subsidies than the rest of Britain. Per, per capita, I think the average for all of Britain is about £9,000 something. And each Scottish citizen per capita uh, receives in subsidies, and that includes transport and stuff like that, from the government. Scotland is not the richest part of the uh, the, the um, United Kingdom, and therefore they don't have the but same reasons. it's not always economics that drives, uh, that drives uh, na no. nationalism. It's, it's, it's ideology. Uh, it's, it is ideology. It certainly is not economics, whereas in Catalonia, I think a great deal of it was also economics, because I think Catalonia, like the former Lega Nord in Italy, were uh, tired of uh, paying for everybody else in Spain, quote unquote. I'm not saying they're right mm. or not. I'm saying that's what I heard at the time. Let's take a look at what's going on here. Uh, they have a term in French for when the country slows down for Christmas. It's called the confectioner's truce, the idea that candy makers can now enjoy a well-deserved break. Travelers have been promised a partial respite from strikes that have been going since December the 5th in France, with a few more trains before it all kicks off again with fresh pension reform protests in the new year. Train conductors, who currently retired 52, particularly mobilized in uh, the biggest uh, labor challenge to Emmanuel Macron since his 2017 uh, election as uh, president. So, yeah, let's give the travel news here, Regis. Uh, it's going a little better on this uh, Friday before Christmas, but it's still uh, chaos well, out there. it's not really going a li little better. I mean, if you say a little better, one train out of five in, on some lines, uh, 
with the exception of if you take the metro, the Paris metro, with the exception of the automatic trains of the number right. one and number two. The high speed trains, it's one I out of I took the metro this morning. It was by chance that I was uh, I was really lucky to get to the destination I was wanting to, to get to. And uh, and obviously what I heard from, you know, going uh, coming here, that's, that's, it's going to be... Not so it strikes be, for Christmas as well. Yeah, and, and, and tomorrow, tomorrow is going to... There's not, there has not been many improvement. I mean, if you look at the... Uh, what uh, the the prime minister um, Edouard Philippe has been showing a good face and trying to you know negotiate talked with saying he was not he was uh, firm but not close to uh, negotiation and you know and, and and appealing to everyone and talking to everyone around the table but there's not not been any change I mean the the the, the change that could you know trigger a movement within the syndicate would be the, the age of retirement, but which is, uh, you know, something, that, a, a principle that the CFDT, which is one of the uh, main uh, union, uh, has been looking. But the other one, they don't care. They want the reform to get out. They, they don't want the they don't want the reform. They want, they want the reform scrap withdraw. Yeah. And 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 this is not what the government is about to do. So there's going to be a huge demonstration <laughs> planned on um, January, I believe, 9th. Uh, January 9th. And and again, we're going to count the number of people that are going to be on strike. And and so it's going to be all over again. Um, I hope that uh, you know the French people will have enough trains to go on vacation and that it won't won't be chaos uh, in the main uh, train station. But I'm not sure about that. Your thoughts on the strikes, New York? I'm, I'm not going to... Today, I'm going to play that, uh, you know, the distractor. Just like politicians, you know, they don't uh, go to <laughs> answer the questions that they ask. I'm trying to not answer your, the, the questions that we are raising huh. here and rather draw attention to other things. And I think one of the reasons why these, uh, these uh, strikes are actually, uh, you know, so persistent one of the many reasons, is also that a lot of people now feel that this is the only way they can be heard. So, for example, you know, the very recent mm. uh, feminist protest that we had, which was the biggest march ever in France from a feminist perspective, and I bring this in because this is the time when we have to start looking that the disenfranchised, which is women, uh, people who are working small jobs, these are people who are going to find... Uh, they want to find a way to stop this. So, so resistance, a blockade, this is what I'm thinking, that there are people who are actually beginning to say, let's just stop going to work. So it's, 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 just, just to be clear on this, it's, it's not just that the French like to go on strike, although it, it is to a certain degree that we like, just like Boris Johnson goes on about how much the British love the National Health Service there, we like our social wealth, our welfare system. Oh, the French. Uh, the, it's very interesting because the uh, you, you talk about populism in all of Europe as if it were one united movement, but it's like Tolstoy's unhappy families. Everybody does pop every nation does populism in their own way, and the French way to do populism is to want more state, to want the going back to the thirty years, the trente glorieuses, as the French call them, after World War Two, when the country was reconstructing, when there was growth, but when I there would, was a great, when there were a great deal of civil when there, when there, can I finish my sentence, Sorry. please? Thank you. Uh, we want to go back to the Trente Glorieuse. We want to go back to a period where you had a great deal of social services, where you had good pensions because you had eight people at work paying for one single pink person having retired. And in general, you also had a ruling class that was made of civil servants but you have who were had, completely this disinterested. Is fact, an erosion no of social services, an erosion of the state uh, that's been yes. noticeable I, I, over I, decades. I agree with Nupur on this one. I think people feel at the same time that the, the value of the services have gone down and nobody listens to them. Until, until, unless they make a gigantic fuss, and that's a great that's a great tradition. But it's also that they are going back; they're looking back at a time which I said something which is not going to happen again because we're not going to have five. Okay, so I, I agree and with most can of I what you're saying. Please. Yeah, but I mean, like, the, no, but I'd like to finish here. instead of being interrupted. Okay, fine. They always say that men as long interrupt as, women. as you wrap it up in. But in so a you're few being minutes. very mannish on this one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But. Uh, no, what I'm saying is that there will not be growth of 5% anymore in France, and therefore some things we will not see again. There will not be the same age pyramid. Uh, that being said, I understand the people who go on strike, because that's exactly what you said. Okay, so I was just trying to have a conversation with you. I wasn't interrupting you. Yes, you But were. I wanted mm -hmm. to say that there is one thing that I agree with you, that yes, we want to go to a past which is hard to attain right now, but it's not just about that. Mm. A lot of people who are fighting, uh, uh, you know, with these strikes or with other things are actually far less privileged than you and I are, and especially you, Anne. Sure. So this is not just about the conservative point of view of, oh, we are trying to disrupt things, and this is populism. People's lives are disrupted. 
Hmm. People uh, do not have jobs. Uh, they cannot, uh, you know, they cannot get help uh, when they need medication. There is racism in France. There are tons of things that are happening right, here. here, here to make it as simplistic <clears throat> as this is just populism trying to get back to a golden past, well, that's not enough. We that's need not to what go I beyond said, that. But, if, hmm. if I can add one thing to, to all of this is that the, um, for, I think it's, it's rather rare to have the far right and the far left demonstrating against the government. Like, and, and you have this, you have Marine Le Pen and you have Jean-Luc Jean Mélenchon united in, in that, which is, you know, I, I don't think it's a first, but it's, it's all the movement, and, as you said, and it's, this, this basically are the, you know, uh, the, the lower middle class people and the people from the working class uh, that are in the street. And, and, uh, and this is, I think, a sign that uh, we have a tendency to see, uh, it, it's, um, you know, in, in our society, in, and especially uh, in France, when you're uh, moving around Paris, you, you tend not to see what's happening in, in the deep uh, France. And, and, and this is a movement when you, when you talk about, uh, for instance, the teachers. Uh, the first strike that occurred on the December 6th, one teacher out of two went on strike, which is huge. It's 450,000 people mm. uh, all of a sudden. Why? And, and, they, and there were people, there were teachers, usually the teachers are the ones who currently protest. their pensions are based on the last six months of their Exactly. Of and, their, and, and, uh, and, they, they, and they did their math, and, and they're, they're going to lose. And a number of other people. It's not only mm. uh, the, visib the most visible part is, of course, the, 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 you know, the train drivers and, 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 and these people, because they have this power to interrupt, and, and they, ha they have this power to right. cause mess but a lot of people are losing with that reform and there, they, there they, is there is a true. just one more thing I wanted to say Francois was that you know there was a nurse who was talking about the strikes and she said that you know she just works for a small uh, company that sends her to the to a big chain of hotel to work and she said that you know all the tourists that are coming to Fra uh, uh, France I'm the person I'm the woman who's cleaning the hotel rooms you know mm. and if I'm not going to turn up well, then, you know, there are going to be consequences and I'd rather not go to work, even if the trains and the metro is moving, uh, because there has to be a blockade. And I think that's the sentiment that we need to also focus on. But there's been a winner in all this, which is um, bicycle salesmen. The numbers have <laughs> shot up on the road since the start of the month, uh, plus 104 percent in the French capital. Uh, there's also been more accidents, by the way, not just uh, two wheelers. There's been uh, ac accidents involving, you know, uh, bicycles, scooters, Marc Bassett's uh, uh, up 40 percent. But uh, what's your thought of it's been since December 5th. What's your thought of Paris during strike days? Well, uh, Parisians are trying to get used to a new lifestyle, we could say, uh, even if it's just uh, almost three weeks. But it's also uh, it's a very Parisian uh, uh, strike, contrary to the Yellow Vest a year ago, which was a strike in the small uh, cities in the pro French province, a strike motivated uh, by the, the issue of car, of, uh, of, of, of gas, diesel, etc. Uh, now it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a strike that affects mostly Paris, uh, but I haven't been out of Paris in the last, I don't know you, but in the last uh, days, but it seems that if once you get out of Paris or big uh, French cities, the strike is not as visible. Of course, the day that the teachers uh, do, do a strike, it is. But the rest of the days, it's all continuous uh, transportation. It's almost strike. normal in, in many parts. It's almost normal. Uh, we can have a lot of discussions about the, the French malaise, the, the problems with the welfare state, etc. But it's a strike of a very tiny part of the uh, French working force, really. The, the transport. transport unions, are the transport ones unions, are the who have a strike. huge power. But to go back to what you just said, I think what's what's worrisome is the fact that there's a, a climate and there's been a climate of social unrest for over a year, and and this situation, you know, with the pensions, with the uh, retirement uh, issue, is only one part. I mean, it's it's key to the government because Macron, as it said in in 2017, uh, 16 during his campaign, was going to make this as a you know, sort a of cornerstone, uh, cornerstone of, of his presidency. But in fact, the 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 social unrest created that, uh, on on this particular issue adds to a climate of social unrest that's been going on right. for over a year, oh. and we don't really know where this is going to go. I mean, maybe we'll get a re little relief for Christmas and and New Year's Eve, but uh, it's going to be back to business. I, I'm afraid. Right. Also, right. the larger right. picture, right. there has right. been uh, yellow vest, new nuit yeah. debout. So in some way or the other, the discontent is 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 hitting back. You know, it's it's not going away. All right.
Narendra Modi may have won a landslide re-election earlier this year, but could India's Hindu nationalist leader now be facing his stiffest challenge, the swift passage of the Citizenship Amendment Act, breathing life into a seemingly subdued opposition. The bill offers a path to Indian nationality for refugees from Muslim-majority Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh. Muslims conspicuously absent from the list of religions specified. The Prime Minister issuing a tweet in English earlier this week. I want to unequivocally assure my fellow Indians that it does not affect citizens of India of any religion. Uh, he goes on to say that uh, this is for those who faced years of persecution outside and have no other place to go for, uh, except for India. Uh, that is not reassuring, though, the country's estimated 170 to 200 million Muslims, nor those who believe that India should remain a secular state. You have everything. You have army, you have police, you have, we are, have nothing. We are, you know, you can see that we have only our national uh, flag. But then also we are fighting against this because we are more powerful than you. I'm scared. We're all scared. And we do not want to be frightened in our own country. I am scared for my friends who are Muslims and I feel bad for them. And I don't want to feel that way and that's why I'm protesting here. Is this going to blow over, Newport Tawari? Not so easily. For two reasons. One is that, you know, when you, when you started talking about India, you said that uh, this, is, uh, this is perhaps one of Modi's biggest challenges. Is he facing a challenge? I think the people of India are facing a challenge in, in Modi, you know, because what you see right now happening in India is being, is being reported as violent protests. Now, for those who don't know, uh, a lot of protests that happen in states that were not under the BJP uh, control in the sense that not BJP governed states, but states governed by others had perfectly peaceful uh, protests, uh, non-violent protests. It's only in the states where the BJP has control, where it's shutting down the internet. This is literally a digital extension of human rights violations, shutting down mobile networks in Delhi. I mean, come on. In, they in, say it's to prevent inflammatory speech that could heighten violence. The inflammatory speech actually comes from BJP's followers. Uh, and there is this, so this anyway has been, and you know, I have been on your shows before to say this and received a lot of army of trolls uh, critiquing me for that. But this has always been the agenda of this government to create unrest, to pit uh, Hindus against Muslims. This, this has played out already in Gujarat in, in this very similar pattern before. And this, this whole, you know, the whole uh, uh, Citizenship Amendment Act that has been brought in, it's a completely arbitrary law that has been brought in. It's a very complex thing for me to explain here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it suffices perhaps to explain that Assam, which is a very large state in India with a very porous border, is actually opposing this bill for very different reasons. Because there was, uh, you know, a survey done for the NRC where, where uh, people were going to see how many illegal immigrants are there. Now, this didn't go according to the expectations of the BJP because there were a lot of Hindus coming in from Bangladesh as illegal uh, immigrants. Uh, so they tried to cover that up by bringing in this new law. And, you know, this whole thing of, uh, you know, demonizing Muslims, of uh, uh, projecting Hindus that are the majority as, uh, as a community in danger and therefore only making a law which is uh, for Hindus, Christians, Sikhs, etc., and deliberately eliminating uh, Muslims, not including Muslims when Burma, Myanmar is just right next to India, uh, and the Rohingyas are being uh, persecuted <coughs> there, uh, and, and not including Ahmadiyas, and, you know, there are communities of Muslims that are persecuted in Pakistan. And then coming up with all sorts of, uh, you know, weird defense for these bills that are, a lot of people are saying that these acts are not even possible to implement. They are not going to benefit mm. anybody. It's just to create a narrative. We, we, we began the show wondering how the democracy was, was, was doing in America. How's democracy doing in India? And he's a bit me too. I know less about democracy in India. It's, I mean, it still is a democratic country. But I, I have more questions than answers than I would, I would ask them from Nupur because uh, what was the point specifically now when the president has been re-elected with such, uh, you know, such a majority? Why do this? You can understand somebody who feels that he really has to gain more followers. Why is he doing this now? Oh, because like I said, this has all, always been the BJP's agenda uh, to work on 
uh, the <coughs> lines of religious divide. And in fact, in the region, now they have this, uh, they've also had this ambition of but that to what effect? Hindu nation uh, to, to have this kind of dominance in the area as the Hindu nation. So Hindus are most welcome where they are being persecuted to come into India as if Hindus are the, uh, are the persecuted minority when in fact they are the oppressor majority in India. Mm. Uh, so the BJP actually has a, <coughs> has a very, very uh, extremist Hindutva ideology. Uh, you know, they have been doing this little by little expanding their, their their base and now actually passing laws. In fact, this winter parliament session was a horror uh, for a lot of minorities. There were trans people who were completely uh, unhappy and rejected uh, 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 an act which was made for their protection. Right. So this is actually literally playing out uh, like, like a, a kind of Nazi regime, you know, where you are. And this is not an exaggeration anymore. There are tons of people who are actually even supporting the BJP who have now understood that this regime is actually working like an autocratic. Remember that the press right. has been warned. The press has been warned. Okay, we're running short on time. Yes. I, I was wondering, I mean, maybe you could... Uh, just, uh, we're, we're, unfortunately, we're out of time. So I okay, I just, just wondering how um, uh, how this is going to play out with Pakistan and how the the, the, the relation between India and Pakistan. I think, is this going to create new tension? Apparently, uh, Imran Khan put out a statement about all this. Yeah, he and, did uh, put out a statement. Uh, and, and, it, and it will obviously play out, especially because of, uh, well, in disputed Kashmir, the internet yeah. is still out since the month of August. But it's... A, Unfortunately, we're running short on time. Regis Le I want to thank you. And then Elisabeth Moutet, I want to thank Newport Tuari, Mark Bassett. Stay with us.